just coming back with the biggest grin thinking that's not just an experience, that's my car, I can go out and do that every single day. Three years and it's been, it's been a tough three years, a lot of learning, which has always been good and the amount of people that I've met through it as well, I talk about the financial side of a car like that, but having friends and making contacts and meeting new people is priceless, you can't, you can't put a worth on that. Um, so yeah, it's been fantastic really. Uh, I'm Connor and this is my Nissan S14A. From being about 14, 15 in school, I just remember seeing uh, S14s on Facebook and the internet and things like that and I was just, something just took me. I think it was the, the anger in the front lights of them. I just really liked the sort of stance and attitude that they had for some reason. And even though they were far bigger, better, more expensive, higher powered cars, but there's just something about the way they look that I just never seemed to get past and ever since being that age it was like that is the car I want. So I had my MX-5, um, I'd had it about two years, I was looking at putting uh, a cage in it and turbo in it and all that sort of stuff which was obviously quite a lot of money to be spending and I thought you know what I still want an S14 that's the end goal let's just sort of have a look at insurance prices and see if we're at a time where it's doable yet and to my surprise it was so I said right let's see what's out there started having a look on the market went and had a look at a few and then stumbled upon this one in wales it was a uk car so the insurance was not too bad for me at that sort of age it was a bit rough but it was like you know what it's an s14 it's the dream car i can have it now let's just grab one because you never know what's going to happen and that was kind of the mindset so I just went for it so the car was on some quite cheap sort of eBay coilovers um, and some white five spoke wheels, which were, were nice enough, but they weren't really to my taste. But apart from that, it was one of the quarter panels had been rattle canned. It was a little bit, well, it was a lot rough. Um, yeah, it wasn't the nicest car, but it was solid. You know, it was a nice starting block. It hadn't been messed about with too much to a point where you were sort of chasing problems. So it seemed like a good starting place. Plans when I first got it were literally just to obtain the car and then afford to run it. Yeah, it was a lot of spending to fix things but not really getting very far. So it was a bit of a hurdle at first, to be honest. I always had plans of, you know, putting a body kit on it, changing the wheels up, just making it like a nice street car. That was all I ever really expected and wanted. It was just the path it was led down with things breaking and then it was like okay well we might as well upgrade as opposed to replace and things like that so yeah it's just kind of been um, it wasn't so much I've got a list of things I want to do let's work through it was just kind of as things came up this is where we ended up it started out uh, with uh, with Johnny actually Johnny with the CRX who's a good friend of mine and a, a club member because the paint was so rough but we were working on a very small budget you know I wasn't earning a great deal of money but it was like finally gained the dream car so let's just kind of make it nice as as we can you know um, so we were going to plastic dip it at the time because that was quite a big trend um, and it was fairly inexpensive then we kind of looked at the dints on the car and the scratches and things like that and decided that you know what it's just not going to come out very nice you're going to spend not massive amounts of money but enough and it's just not going to come out great um so then we said okay let's um grab a few friends and paint the car so then it was save up buy a body kit and then it became not just front bumper skirts all that sort of stuff it was like okay let's do a wide body it's not the craziest biggest wide body but it's um rear over fenders, wider wings, all that sort of stuff. Um, so we prepped all the kit, got the car prepped, and we literally prepped and painted it in a week. Um, which is a massive thanks to, to Johnny, because without him, I'd still be rubbing a front bumper down somewhere. So, and that was, you know, three years ago. So yeah, that was how the car came to be white. Um, again, it wasn't a plan. It wasn't like, oh yeah, I'm gonna buy this car. It's like, I want it white. It was just, Cost led me that way, roping friends in to help out, and it just sort of ended up finding its way. And um, what a way to find, you know. Very lucky to be able to do that and have, obviously, Johnny to help me do that because, you know, not everyone has a friend that's, you know, 
has the art of bodywork like he does. So yeah, massively thankful for that. So interior, um, nothing crazy, rear seats removed, uh, mainly just so that we, the harnesses can go in. Um, and then you've got Corbu uh, sports seats up front, um, the usual steering wheel bits and bobs like that. Um, but again, nothing really crazy. It was just trying to make it racy looking, give it that nice sort of Japanese street car kind of thing but without making it undrivable. You know, we still like to take the car on road trips, do hundreds of miles without it being too uncomfortable and too loud and like you're in a tin can, you know. So engine, it's still an SR20. That was always the plan. It was never to really go crazy with it. I got uh, a package from some friends uh, from a donor car, which was a Link ECU, a manifold, uh, front mount intercooler, bits like that, and it was essentially sort of a 300, 350 horsepower bolt-on kit. Uh, so we did that, that was amazing, it was like going from a 200 horsepower standard car, which was already fast to me, um, up to sort of 300 horsepower plus was just crazy, you know, blew my socks off, I was like, wow, this is, you know, you hear people talk about six, 700 horsepower, and it's like, yeah, but 300 feels like a million, you know, it was crazy. Um, then, unfortunately, the engine, it didn't blow up, but it broke. Um, typical thing with an SR, um, rocker arm, hit the cover, smashed into a million pieces. Um, it went to Slide Motorsport for them to have a look. Um, my mechanical knowledge is very, very basic to none. Um, explained what had happened, got it trailered there. Um, they found the arm, uh, checked the sump and it was like someone had crushed a ball bearing and tipped it out into the sump and they said, you know, this can be an easy repair. We can throw a new arm in and it may be fine. But in reality, I kind of sat myself down and went, well, Connor, that's not going to be fine. Um, so then it was like, OK, we need to rebuild it, which then became, all right, well, if you're going to rebuild it, why put your standard old parts in? So then it became forging it. Um, so we did manly rods, Wiseco pistons, half a mil oversized. The bore was uh, improved on the block by half a mil. What else did we do? We did HKS cams in it, Brian Cower uh, lifters, titanium valve springs and retainers and all that sort of stuff. So it literally just spiraled from just that one little incident of the engine going. And then it was that typical thing of you can't bear to just replace and still pay good money for it. It was like, well, why not pay that bit more and really go all out with it? But as with anything with that car, it's you look at spending one thing on that and then it has to come with seven other things that cost twice as much as what you originally thought. So it really spiralled. It was really tough times financially because, again, it wasn't planned. You know, I hadn't saved and saved and saved for this huge project. It just arrived and needed paying for. Um, but we got there in the end and now, we're through the hard times with it financially and all that sort of stuff. It was definitely the right way to go. And now to have a car that can handle more power than I will ever use at the end of the day, it's a street car, you know, um, is great because it's sort of worry-free. You know, the power I will use it at, it's not really putting a great deal of pressure on it. It's quite forgiving, so it's good to go. Purpose has always been a street car, obviously, with it being an S chassis, everyone's like, oh, you know, is it a drift car, is it a drift car, why don't you drift it, blah, 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 and it's like, don't get me wrong, drifting is amazing, I love it, always been a huge fan, and, and that's kind of where the love for those cars stemmed from. Um, I don't have the skill to drift, I would love to, you know, and there's been the odd cheeky manoeuvre here and there on private property with permission and all that sort of stuff, but, you know, it's not a drift car, it's set up as a street car, I use it as much as I possibly can. Um, I'm not a big believer in sort of tucking it away in the garage and using it three times a year. You know, if it's spring, summer time, the car's out, I'm enjoying it. You know, you never know what's going to happen kind of thing. So if you've got the time and you're able to use it, then get out and enjoy it. Um, I would like to try and get it on track um, this coming year. Uh, that's something that I'm looking at doing. Uh, through a couple of friends and then that may spiral into a drift day which would be amazing to learn yeah there's a lot of avenues it could go it's quite a nice platform because it's a fantastic street car it could quite happily be a capable track car it could be a very capable drift car you know so it can be adapted with 
a quick suspension setup to do quite a lot of things, which is quite nice. I would say biggest difficulties for me have been the amount of problems that have arisen with it, with repairs and things like that. And again, with my mechanical knowledge not really being there, you know, I don't come from a mechanical background. Um, my previous cars never really needed any work. They were pretty much getting it and go. So it was coming to something like this, which is obviously old. It can be a bit temperamental at times. You know, I wasn't earning a great deal of money when I bought that. So it kind of left me with not a great deal. So every time a repair came up, it was like, oh, that's great. I've paid for that repair, but now it's like, trying to recover from it myself um, and keep the dream going. You know, I, I was stretching to get that car when I did do, um, but now looking at how the market is going with all Japanese cars, yes, it was a stretch and maybe not the best decision at that point in time, but I definitely don't regret it um, because I speak to so many people now and they say, oh, you know, I want an Evo, I want a Skyline, I want this, I want that. And I just always say, you know, if you want a Japanese car at the minute, you know, your, your higher end performance sort of stuff, just grab them while you can because in a few years time, they're just not at a point where they're obtainable by the average person. It gets attention from all different people, all ages and all walks of life, you know. I've spoken to 75, 80 year old women that have had um, an S13 when they were brand new and they said, oh, is that a 200 SX? And it's like, yeah, actually. And they said, oh, you know, I had one of these 20 years ago when they were brand new and it's it's great to have um, like a little bit of a common ground because usually with being into your cars and obviously it's loud and it's silly, you don't usually get to talk to people like that. So it's great to find common ground and just have a bit of a chat as if, you know, as if you know each other kind of thing. Then you get like dads coming up to you with their kids, oh, can we sit in it? Can we do this? Can we do that? And it's like, yeah, you know what? Feel free, like that's what it's all about, you know. In my opinion, if you've got a car that gets attention, let people enjoy it. I take people out regularly in it. If I go to a little get together locally, you know, mums will come up to me, oh, you know, my son loves your car, he loves Fast and Furious, blah, blah, blah. Would you mind nipping him out? And it's like, yeah, of course I will, you know, because if someone did that for me when I was a kid and I was watching Fast and Furious, God, my mind would have been blown, you know, it would have made my year. So I just think, pass it on, let people do that. And then when they come round to having these sorts of cars, they might do the same thing, you know. I think, the biggest achievement with the car is not actually direct with the car. I think it's using the car as a platform to begin exclusive JDM. Um, that is essentially where, it's, where it came from. We kind of built the car to a point where it was getting noticed a little bit and then used that to elevate our name, um, which is what we're also now doing with our 350Z as well. So exclusive JDM started um, around sort of April 2018. It was all based on the idea that we'd been to a lot of car shows and a lot of get togethers and things like that. And we found ourselves sort of sifting through the waves of cars to try and find specifically the Japanese cars, not also that, but the higher end Japanese cars, the more modified, the rarer, the cleanest, you know, and that's what we ended up doing. So we go to huge car shows with thousands and thousands of cars and we were only looking at probably 100 closely. Um, so we thought, okay, can we not kind of take all those cars that we're looking at and condense them down into a concentrated display of high quality Japanese cars? So therefore, Exclusive JDM was born. Um, now I invited sort of close friends with suitable cars and things like that and said, look, this is what I'm trying to do. You know, I don't know how serious it's going to go and all that sort of stuff, but join in, give it a go, you know, just kind of keep your eye on it and see what happens. Um, and then I believe it was June or July 2018, uh, we, have, we held our first um, club stand at Japfest Donington. We weren't big at that point, we might have had a couple of hundred members. Again, spread nationwide, so it was quite hard to grab a considerable amount of people to do a club stand. Anyway, we said, you know what? It's dead easy to register for a club stand. We'll do it, it'll be something fun we've never done before, you know. It felt quite big at that time to be, oh yeah, you know, we've got our own club stand, that's amazing. Um, so we went ahead and in the end, we ended up with, I believe, 50 to 52 cars. Um, booked on and these are all you know S chassis, Skylines, RX-7s, MX-5s, 350Zs, just 
all sorts of Japanese cars, but they were all of a really high quality. And we looked at the cars that were coming and these were the early days of the club where 50 cars were a hell, hell of a lot. And we kind of looked through and we were like, wow, there's this wide body RX-7 coming. There's um, this FC RX-7, there's um, a, a drift car coming. You know, this was, this was amazing to us and it kind of blew our minds. And then it came together on the day and we had this display of these sort of 50 just in my opinion jaw-dropping cars that we'd never really seen before you know we'd seen mixed club stands and things like that but it was usually local guys 10 to 15 cars and that's fantastic but no one had ever done it this sort of scale and kept that quality and it came together on the day and I remember just walking away from that thinking like wow that was you know I expected it to be good and obviously car shows are always fantastic we really enjoy them but something just clicked and it was like, I got a real buzz from it almost, something I'd never really felt before. Um, and I thought, you know what, this has become something we can actually work at and just keep going and see how far we can take it. Um, so we continued doing club stands through 2018 um, and 2019, again, just growing bigger and bigger and bigger and, and keeping that quality um, to a point where we're in the thousands of members and the club was really picking up ground and moving pretty quickly. Um, and that takes us pretty much to where we are now, where you know, we've, we're still doing club stands at other people's shows. You know, we still do Jap Performance Show, which is fantastic, Jap Fest, which we all know is amazing, Jap Show Santa Pod, all that sort of stuff. We'll still more than happily do them because they're fantastic. And now we've held shows nowhere near on that sort of scale but even on, from the ones we've held we now understand the work time and effort that goes into those shows so it's really important still to support them and and go out of your way to say yes they are amazing because the time effort and money that people put in is is created to hold these things and i think that's something that you know i'll admit from going to them for five six seven years you do overlook you know you turn up you show your car you leave at the end of the day and you don't usually give a thought to the amount of effort that's gone in to produce an event like that um, now being on the other side of things where we've now held three car shows again the size hasn't been quite what they are but keeping the quality has sort of been our battle as opposed to having numbers um, so we kind of look at it from a different angle now where we see the work that goes in and you, you really stop and appreciate that once you've seen what it takes. With Exclusive JDM it started with the idea of the best quality Japanese cars. It wasn't, it didn't have to be a certain Japanese car, it can be absolutely anything, you know, whether it's highly modified, particularly rare, exceptionally clean, you know, they're sort of the three things we work off. And also, it can be none of those, but if we look at it and think, you know what, if we saw that somewhere, we would take a few minutes to have a look around it and appreciate it, then that's what we want. Um, it's nothing to do with, oh, you haven't spent 10,000 pounds you know, on modifications for your car, or it's not a half a million pound skyline that there's only two of in the world. It's nothing to do with that, you know. We've got cars that are, you know, probably worth 500 to 1,000 pound in the club. You know, we've got people with, with uh, you know, early micros. You know, they're not worth a great deal of money, but the time and effort that people put into those cars, they're immaculate, they're doing really cool things with them. So it's nothing to do with your budget. There is no, you know, it's not a, uh, like some clubs where if your car isn't worth so much, then you're not coming in. It's not like that at all. This club is accessible to anyone. Um, if you put in the work in to make your car stand out, we will see it and we will invite you in. Um, we've got a guy called Jay uh, in the club who's, you know, he's only 17 years old. He's a really young guy, but he's so passionate about it. He's got a, um, a Micra, uh, it's a, a special edition one. It's like a emerald green kind of color and that car, it's not worth a great amount of money but you know what it is immaculate and the love he has for it is great and it's so cool to see someone so young being so involved and taking so much care in that car you know so that's why he's in the club it's not you know it's nothing to do with value or how much you've spent but that's what's great like our events that we host you've got people with half a million pound skyline and then you've got people like jay with their micros that you know aren't worth that much money but they're in that same league and they're, they're talking to each other and that's a bridge that you would never probably cross with those two cars because 
they're not on the same league in other people's worlds, but to us they are. They have the same passion, the same love. The budget may be different, but that doesn't matter. You know, that's what keeps it different. If everyone had half a million pound skylines, it wouldn't quite be the same world. So it's great to see all different budgets, all different walks of life, everyone in the same place with the same passions, just getting on, and that's what it is. Um, if you think you've got a car that would be suitable for the club, then drop us a message on either Facebook, Instagram, you'll find us on there as Exclusive ADM. The amount of people we've met through the club, I mean, even Andy, you know, she's made friends through the club. A lot of our sort of close team that help us out on the on show days, they've made friends through the clubs. We've all made contacts through buying and selling parts. And it's just really become this huge community. And I think one of the best things for me personally is now when we host a show or a club stand, I'll see um, someone from sort of the south coast that I know come and park up and then one of the guys that comes down from Dumfries in Scotland park up and they don't, they've never known each other before but they'll get out of the cars and chat to each other and say oh how are you going mate you know I saw you at the last show you know and that is such an amazing feeling to think that you've brought those people together and they've now created a friendship and that is something that we hold in such high regards because that doesn't happen easily you know um, it's just so, so nice to see. That is really what makes it for us. Um, just, the, the community gets better and better each event we do. Everyone gets together, they get chatting again. Oh, I see you've changed this on your car. Oh, you've got future plans, you know. And it just keeps going and going and going and the community gets better and stronger every time. And it's so, so nice to see, it, it's amazing. Uh, so I've had the car getting on for three and a half years now um, and which is odd because in some ways it feels like 10 years but I think that's because we've done so much with it like it's been to so many places and it's seen so many different looks and all this sort of stuff it's kind of flown by in a weird way three years and it's been it's been a tough three years um, a lot of learning which has always been good and the amount of people that I've met through it as well um, not only the sort of S chassis community, but the Jap scene. Obviously, that car was a massive introduction to the heavier side of the Japanese scene. A lot of companies now that I'm good friends with, Slide Motorsport, the amount of times it's been up there for work, it's like we have a good working relationship with them, not only through me and my car, but through the club as well. It's gained me a lot of contacts and a lot of friends, um, which, you know, I talk about the financial side of a car like that, but having friends and making contacts and meeting new people is priceless you can't you can't put worth on that um, so yeah it's been fantastic really driving the s14 for the first time i remember the first time i ever took it out um, i had a friend with me of course oh, come on, come on, come on, yeah. um, and i'd only ever driven naturally aspirated cars not particularly good power um, yeah, that was only sort of 200 horsepower the first time I got it, but 200 horsepower to me felt like 2,000 horsepower, you know, it was just, I'd never really been in a car that had, you know, more than sort of 140, 150 horsepower, and the way that the boost came in was just unlike anything I've ever felt before. Again, sounds so silly because now we're in different leagues where four or 500 horsepower cars aren't really a big deal anymore, but to me they were, it was a whole new world. Um, I remember putting my foot down on a back road, just taking it up to 60s through sort of second and third and just being like, wow, like I've just never felt anything like that before. And it was just, just coming back with the biggest grin thinking, that's not just an experience, that's my car, I can go out and do that every single day. Um, and obviously the, the classic turbo blow off noises, you know, it's that little giddy child inside you that that smiles every time you let off you know that's never gone away um, which is fantastic it's like it's great that there's little stupid things you still get excited about and I think that's kind of how you know it's still right for you you know it doesn't matter what it is but if it's if it's making you smile then it's right <laughs>